Okay, our final speaker for this uh, afternoon session uh, is Kathleen Plowman from Australian Pork Limited, and Kathleen's presentation is Animal Welfare Lost in Translation. Could we please welcome Kathleen to the podium? Well, I'm not a lawyer, maybe that's a good thing, because there is such uh, well, uh, a wealth of knowledge and uh, expertise uh, of lawyers in the room. But I do bring a different aspect to this debate. Um, I, for my sins, work in policy. I have a lot of empathy for what one of the earlier speakers, Phil Glide, was talking about in terms of policy. I'm damned if I do and I'm damned if I don't. It's a very difficult uh, tightrope to uh, work, a walk. Uh, and one of the things that I aspire to is to uh, create change, good change, and improve animal welfare practices. It may not always be at the pace we like. It may not always be at the desired outcome. But from my point of view and from my industry's point of view, we do take um, animal welfare very seriously and uh, to uh, pick up on part of the early discussions we seriously believe that we have to be involved in the discussion and the debate and not to shy away from it and that wasn't always the case in a livestock industry I'd say back in the 1980s and 1990s it was about um, don't put your head up keep it down so um, the speakers today have really reinforced my view that animal welfare is a very complex issue. It requires a multifaceted approach. I've heard about uh, a fra the fragmented approach uh, from the previous speaker about um, the costs and, and do we have enough resources uh, to enforce uh, animal welfare and to check that it's actually happening? Um, does the current regulatory framework actually fit what we need? Does it need to be overhauled, particularly with industrialisation of farming? And most people would consider pig farming industrialisation, but it is pig farming. Um, but I'd like to actually turn attention to um, something that Phil Glide said when he spoke about legislation is necessary, and I certainly agree with that. And I also agree that it is not sufficient in itself to deliver continuous animal welfare improvement. So, and I want to speak to you about some of those mechanisms, those other opportunities that can complement the law or might, where the law might be able to leverage off those. Importantly, I agree with Phil that industry um, needs to really get ahead of its social responsibilities if it wants to ensure its social, li its so its social licence to farm or to operate. And I also believe, but this is just my belief at this particular point in time, that it is not sufficient for industries to just meet the requirements of the law because of the tide of uh, public perception. Whether that public perception is well informed is another discussion. So I want to talk to you today a little bit about my indus industry's uh, journey the challenges that are ahead, and some of our opportunities. So, I'm hoping this works. Yeah. So, um, as I said, it's a complex issue requiring a multi-faceted uh, approach. These are some of the uh, issues that are facing my industry, and, I, and they really outline why sometimes we can't move quickly. And if you're going to change the law in one area, you need to be very aware of the laws in other areas and the consequences of those changes and the possible unintended consequences. And you may, in fact, be um, creating a situation where there might be a net welfare decline. And therefore, we're not protecting the very animals that we are seeking to protect. So in Australia, we have, well, for my industry, and I'm only speaking about uh, pork, we have rising cheap imported pork meat 
Um, and it is produced at differing standards to Australia and it's often highly subsidised. You might be interested in that, but my farmers are because that affects their ability to make changes on farm. It undermines their competitiveness. Also, if you're a consumer and you really want to make a difference through your purchases, the, the current labelling regime of Australia is in terrible, it's terribly complex and very confusing. I feel one of the privileged few when I can walk into uh, a shop, pick up a, a packaged good and go, I know what made in Australia really means. But for the vast majority of people, they don't. But then we come to the point, will consumers really pay for those changes in welfare that we're advocating? And I often see a lot of uh, uh, surveys conducted by animal welfare groups, but also um, other sur surveys conducted by other bodies. Uh, they are attitudinal surveys mostly in part. And we're all good citizens and we all like to be seen that we, we like to think we would do the right thing when we're in the shops and buy uh, uh, an animal welfare enhanced product. But when I look at the behavioural studies, I see an entirely different picture. Consumers aren't willing, the vast majority of consumers aren't willing to pay for that product. There are niches, and I would also suggest to you that your willingness to pay depends on where you are in your life and in terms of the income that you're uh, earning. So if you're raising a, a young family, you, you'd want to play for that particular, you'd want an animal welfare product, but when you're in the shop, you're going to buy on price because you have to feed your family. These aren't excuses, they are the framework in which producers have to work. The other point is, when we do move, when we change our practices, and in particular, and I'll talk to you about the industry moving out of store-free uh, store voluntarily, um, that means that we have to employ far more skilled and trained labour. But that's in short supply. The mining industry pays far more than what we can pay. We can't compete. Therefore, the, animal, the welfare of the animal will suffer because we don't have that labour. And it, you just can't get anybody on a farm that person has to have the right attributes to farm an animal, to care for it. And that's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Farmers also need money to make the changes that we require of them when we want them to change their animal welfare practices. Times of drought, that's very, very hard. And that's why industry sometimes asks for such longer lead times, because of our ability to finance that change or the fact that we're competing with imports. And then another side issue, um, just to let you know, when we're moving out of sales stores, my producers are faced with incredible environmental red tape in which to do that. More laws of the land. It's a difficult proposition. But yet we still want to work to improve the welfare of our animals. I'm just trying to build an understanding of the issues, just some of the issues that we face. Oh, doesn't want to move. Okay, so I'm just going to talk to you about uh, a story of success, changing an industry practice. I'm not going to talk about all our industry practices. I mean, the, we all know that some of them are not desirable. But I'm going to talk to you about one important practice and why this is such an important step for the industry. And sometimes it's better to do one thing very well <laughs> first off than try to do all things. So um, just quickly, I want to talk to you about, we hear a lot about sales stores and uh, I'm going to have to skip through quite a few of my slides, but it's there, it just gives you the timelines. Uh, there's a lot of talk about was it the animal rights, animal welfare cams, uh, campaigns that created this move by the industry to, uh, to move out of sales stores, was it the Tasmanian government's decision, <coughs> etc. was it the retailer? Well, it, it goes a lot further back than that. The industry has actually been discussing this issue for some time. And there was a culmination of factors. And why were we discussing it? Because we had been looking at consumer perception. We had been looking at public opinion. And we had made a decision that we needed to move. And we made that decision first 
in terms of a formal decision announcement in April 2010. The industry had a discussion around this. We, we launched a strategy because as an industry body, while well, I might represent the industry body, of course, you need buy-in from farmers to make change. That means you must consult and engage. So why did we voluntarily uh, ban, move out of um, sow stall use? Well, the premise was, given that the use of gestation stalls will be forced to cease at some point, would the industry not be better off to proactively discontinue their use and we would improve our community government relations? We could also actively differentiate Australian product from imports. We could create, we hope, consistent and logical standards around these withdrawal and that we could leverage this position and gain support from the retailers and government and also from the welfare lobby, go uh, lobby group for uh, Australian pork. Now, I, I covered off some of these issues anyway at the beginning, so I won't go over them. I also just want to let you know, what's the cost of this just one change to the industry? Well, it's around $50 million. It's, um, it's a lot of capital, and a lot of it is around capital investment. Uh, and there are trade-offs to this decision for the, for the producer, at least in the short to medium term. Uh, which affects their productivity, which in turn affects their ability to finance that change, which in turn affects their, when they go to the bank to sell the idea that we can do this. Um, so as I said, in November 2010, my producers decided that they would voluntarily phase out sales stores. Now I want to emphasise that this was a world first for an industry body, a world first. I think it shows leadership and it shows dedication, particularly when you look at the backdrop of the things that we have to get right in order to get producers to be able to finance this change on farm. So I just want to quickly talk to you about stall free and what does it really mean and how do we compare to what's happening overseas? Because you hear a lot about you know, what's happening in the UK, the EU is often held up as the gold standard. But I'm going to say to you, you need to very carefully read the fine print. So, we have our deadline for implementation, 2017. Uh, the Tasmanian government's 2013. Uh, they are funding that change, by the way, and I'll get to that later. EU, 2013, but they've had something like an eight-year lead time to get to that point. Uh, and then the US, they're all voluntary. Now, if you read the fine print, we're the only... The only ones, actually, other than, other than the UK, which is talking about not using gestation stalls. What, in fact, is happening in uh, the US and EU is that they will still allow sow stall use. You just have to take the time to read the uh, fine print. And maybe this goes back to Elizabeth's earlier point about transparency of information. And this is what's been happening in the US recently, sorry. Lots of declarations around um, we're moving to sow stall free. Well, they're still going to use stalls for at least 28 days, at least. And the other question I'd have is, well, how are they going to verify that they've made that change? And the question you might want to ask me is, how are you going to verify as an industry that you're making that change? And I'll, I'll get to that in my presentation. Just very quickly, January 2013 deadline. You're more interested around the ticks and the question marks. Um, really, the ticks show who's there already. Uh, there's a lot of disparity about, you know, who's actually going to be uh, there on 1 January 2013. And uh, while it might look, the EU is officially stating, yep, we'll be there, behind the scenes, it's an entirely different story. And I'd be very interested to know what the EU is going to do with that pig meat that it will be raised in illegal housing. And I bet there's silence on that. So what about pork imports? I talked a lot about pork imports, how it uh, frames our competitive, um, well, it can undermine our competitive advantage and impact our ability to finance change. Well, the most important thing you need to know is 95% of the pork imported into Australia is not stall free. And then we could look at, well, how could we help producers make this change more quickly? 
obviously when governments uh, provide that assistance, it's the taxpayer who's making the, that uh, change. And because we've made a voluntary decision, uh, really we've been told this is largely up to us to fund, for us to make these changes ourselves. Now Tasmania regulated for this change and said no sales stores used by 2013. But my congratulations to the Tasmanian government because they put their hand in their pocket and said, to help you producers make that change and not drive you out of business, we're going to help you fund to do that. Five minutes. Well, I'm going to have to talk very quickly. So how do I know what we're doing, uh, how we're progressing? Um, this tells you how our progress. One in three sales are not in stalls right now. That's a good figure. We survey this uh, yearly and also internally every quarter to determine how we're making this progress. We've set a target this year of 45%. We've got programs around uh, differentiating Australian pork. The thing you need to understand in terms of retailers and processor market dominance influences what happens for us as an industry. Um, Woolworths and Coles alone hold about 60% of the consumer shopping basket for meat products. 25% of that uh, also is butchers. That's a lot of power and influence by a retailer. Now they can exert good change, but I've also seen some of their policies where I would dispute that that change is effective and I'd also dispute whether it's actually reflecting what uh, consumers want. But that's a different discussion altogether. For my own industry, we also need to be aware of processor dominance. Uh, and those processors are taking in the imports. Two processors at 70%. So they have a lot of sway and a lot of power with producers. The small goods sector, so it's worth one billion a year. Uh, domestically produced pork accounts for about a third of this, only a third. Most Australians, when they eat ham and bacon and small goods, 60 to 70% of that is imported product but it gets lost, lost in translation. But it has a big impact on producers' bottom line. Um, half a billion dollars is sent offshore to other countries, US and Canada, which do not have the same welfare standards as what we do. And we do have inadequate uh, food labelling. Just very quickly, uh, we feel let down by the current, current country of origin labelling regime. Uh, it's all stated there. We were in favour of some of the recommendations of Blewett Review. Um, we thought it could make a, a good change and also help our consumers uh, be more well informed. Um, the Greens Bill that is just up, uh, we do support, but we would require some amendments because it's a step in the right direction, but it, it's just not quite uh, sufficient. So I've talked about supermarket support. They support our QA program, APIC, which we, is fundamental to our industry. Um, and their home brand policies are really important. They need to apply the same policies that they apply to fresh pork as what they do to their home brands. And they are, with the same transition times. And I can say that of Coles. So there are, look, there are a lot of opportunities to drive change, um, na national vendor declarations. Why would that be important? Well, I wish I could talk to you about it because we could t tie in this domestic abattoir uh, issue around that and about compliance and verification. Um, quality assurance, APIC. And I want to talk to you very quickly about the Livestock Management Act. So APIC, that's our QA program. And I heard Elizabeth you know, have some he hesitation around this. Ours is independently audited. We do not uh, employ the auditors, okay? They're independent of us. They have to meet specific trained and skilled requirements. They have to sit an exam every year. They provide the audit reports to us. We have certification policies which uh, it triggers certain actions that must be taken, uh, including expulsion from the program uh, for, um, say, uh, welfare incidences, et cetera. So it has five modules. The one that you'd be interested in is animal welfare. Uh, it is important to us. We do invest and we think we can make great changes through animal welfare on this. Now, we do collect statistics. Collect a lot of statistics, actually. They're there. I'd love to talk to you about them, but I don't have time. <laughs> Common corrective actions within the program. We collect statistics around this. Yes, we do take actions around this. They're all there. 
sorry, can't talk to you about them. <laughs> I can even break down our statistics by state and even further than that. Um, Livestock Management Act. We like the Livestock Act Management Act. I mean, yes, there is a discussion about further regulatory reform, the actual shape of regulation itself, but we think the Livestock Management Act goes a long way, well, is a step in the right direction <coughs> in terms of it recognises producers who are doing the right thing. It recognises that there are constrained resources ensuring compliance, so it'll work with industry in a partnership approach. And anyone who is not in a QA program has to do a risk assessment and is open to random inspections. Resources for government and industries are very, very tight. And therefore, we have to work and achieve and leverage what we can for the best result for animal welfare. I don't think I've ever spoken so quickly in my life. Uh, OK, you just need to look at the pork CRC. What are we doing about the future? Well, we're investing in animal welfare through our pork CRC, the environment, etc. cetera. Um, what it'll do is produce, we're looking at producing pork in sow confinement um, without the need for sow confinement and to reduce the use of antibiotics. Go to the website. Uh, it's a very interesting program and you can see the list of uh, very interesting uh, partners we have and thanks to the Australian Government, I have to do that for assisting in the funding of that. So just to wrap up, I don't think there is a simple answer. It's a partnership approach that we need to be ensuring. Um, I think that will improve animal welfare, it will improve uptake, it will help, it will show compliance because you need verification of compliance. Uh, regulation which complements market forces and leverages industry tools is far more powerful instrument than regulation on its own. And uh, I would just like to come back to we need a dialogue. I certainly agree with what Alex was saying. It's in all in our vested interests and we need an open mind. The regulation on its own is just is not the answer. Thank you. Okay, well we've got about 10 minutes uh, for questions uh, for Kathleen. So uh, yes, we've got a question there first and uh, we've got some others lined up. There's a question over there and then the third question at the back. So we've got the mics moving. Yes. Hi, Anne Greenaway from Lawyers for Companion Animals. I've just got a question about one of your overheads which referred to a $50 million figure. I'm just wondering how that figure was broken down. It was something to do with shed design, refit or construction. Have you got any further details as to how the $50, that $50 million is broken down? Yes, I do, and I'm more than happy to, to talk to you about that okay. and provide information around that. Thank you. Second question was over there. Have we got the mic? Yep. Yeah. Uh, Tim Bassett, Eva from the Animal Welfare League. Uh, just two things, if you don't mind. One is what was clear from your presentation that you mentioned a number of times was that a, a lot of the changes that you're making are in response to changes in uh, consumer expectations and consumer patterns, which I think to me reinforces what Graham was saying is that that is a powerful way of influencing animal welfare outcomes and yet you seem to be using those changes and taking credit for them as if they were driven by welfare considerations because I didn't hear you use references to animal welfare or the conditions in which your pigs of your members were kept at any stage during that presentation. You were talking about consumer expectations and yet you're taking credit as if it was driven by welfare concerns and a proactive perspective. That's one thing. The second thing would be, given the programs that you mentioned, CRC and APIC, certainly seem very impressive on the face of them, but uh, I'm wondering how uh, programs which appear to provide oversight and quality reassurance would apply in light of the uh, recent Pickery case that you'd be aware of down near Canberra which, if you see the vision, is a very large facility, 4,500 pigs, and quite clearly appear to show very, very, very serious breaches of the Prevention of Cruelty of Animals Act and the codes of practice that have been very, very long-standing. And how can that occur, given these programs that you've just mentioned? OK. Um, well, I'll start with the Murren Bateman issue, because I would have loved to... I actually had it as an issue to discuss. Unfortunately, I found... And I found for, for most of the presenters, I would have liked to have heard more and, and, and had discussions around it. Uh, if I go back to the model code, 
when we were in negotiations of the model code, um, we actually uh, requ requested that our quality assurance scheme be mandated. We were also one of the first industries up uh, that actually said, we want the standards regulated in each state. So um, unfortunately though, we were told in the model code negotiation, no, no, we can't do that as states. It's, it's not possible, won't be palatable, etc. Now that was back, and I'd just like to let everyone know, the model code negotiation started in 2004 and didn't actually get signed off to 2007. So in respect of Jed's point um, earlier about reflecting not reflecting um, consumer uh, expectations at that time. Well, I dispute that. It was such a long process. In fact, didn't go up for primary industry ministerial council to 2007. But again, this is all another point. Now, if that piggery at Murrum Bateman had been in our QA program, there is no way it could have got into that condition. No way. And we would argue that any commercial piggery should be in a, an approved compliance program such as ours, APIC. Or, you know, and because I've heard this from other states, you can't restrict competition, therefore any similar kind of comp uh, compliance program that meets those kind of animal welfare standards and is checked and verified. Uh, we're actually in discussion with New South Wales and, and through an, a lot of other venue, uh, avenues where we would like to see the same requirements that are put in for export establishments where national vendor declarations, and I'm kind of wandering off for you in terms of um, animal welfare, but I see so many synergies and interlinkages to how we can affect uh, animal welfare change through other avenues, that we want to see NVDs uh, are supported by QA. So you can't move an animal unless you're in an APIC program. And that domestic abattoirs can't accept an animal unless it's in an APIC program. So as an industry, we can do a lot around getting, trying to move our uh, producers to educate them, to change farming practices. Now that's bottom up. We also need cooperation from top down. And that's uh, where I'd say we wouldn't have got to that situation with that Murrum Bateman. And believe me, my producers were equally appalled. The number of calls I had, I was mortified, I was ashamed uh, as a participant in the industry. It was an awful, awful thing. And don't think that other producers, other farmers didn't feel the same way, they did. And we're trying to affect change and solutions. But we were also constrained by the very environment, the regulatory environment, because of um, the way it's set up. Well, it wouldn't have been a great thing in the model code if they had approved uh, mandated QA. I was a little bit confused by your first question though, sorry. And I was just suggesting that you acknowledging that a lot of the changes that you've made with regard to sow stalls and what have you are driven by consumer behaviour, but the way it's being presented by the pork industry is that you're driven by welfare concerns, which is two very different things. Well actually the, for us, we are driven by both. Ultimately our farmers have to care for the animals and we as a pig body hold animal welfare very uh, seriously and we want to, you know, we invest a lot. It might seem that I'm talking in a very commercial way that, uh, and sometimes I'm quite astounded, it seems that uh, to associate money with um, raising and slaughtering animals is a dirty thing. Sometimes it seems that's the undercurrent, but the fact is you're dealing with people's livelihoods as well. But we are driven by the welfare of the animal. So it, I think it comes back to the very first speaker today it's about your ethics base as well. It's a very interesting discussion. I think it's been a fantastic conference. Got the question over there, and then the last one will be very, uh, in view of time. Mary Bennett from um, DPI Tasmania. Oh, hi, Mary. <laughs> hi, Kathleen. Um, look, I just um, I commend the pig industry for making this voluntary move. I think, um, it, you know, it is a world first. Um, I just wanted to comment on some of the figures up there. Um, changing, it's a changing landscape in Tasmania. Um, there's actually five producers who are affected. 
um, with about uh, less than a thousand sows. So there should be more money per sow that has to make that transition. Um, thank you for acknowledging that funding from the state government. Um, we also provide funding to the RSPCA to carry out their uh, inspectorate activities too. So um, that's nice to have that acknowledged. Thank you. I think that was just a, a comment and just the last question, a, a brief question. If we, if we Jerry might. Adams from the RSPCA in South Australia. You mentioned that um, you have to be competitive against imports and I'm sympathetic to that dynamic. Uh, yet you're able to make the change voluntarily and to no sow stalls. So I presume that means you're still competitive and economic. And I'm wondering if you've studied the other steps you might take that would still leave you economic against foreign imports. Well, at the moment, we are um, uh, economic. But I'm going to tell you now that the drought in the US is having a serious impact on feed grain prices here. The margins, the profit, so that ability to return, make a, a return investment, including maintenance of the facilities, is becoming drastically reduced, particularly as our feed gets exported offshore for those higher prices. It's um, raising animals and uh, because it's done in, you know, an environmental, we're subject to nature, um, it doesn't really take long for us not to be uh, profitable. So yes, we are making those changes and that's why actually for us to monitor what's going on, we, we continue our dialogue with the Commonwealth and the state governments. My, my chair and my CEO are now doing another round to let them know where we're up to, what's happening. We, we're looking at different government funding programs to think of, uh, creatively, a bit like um, what was mentioned previously about law, thinking <coughs> strate creatively, strategically. Well, we have to do the same. Uh, we, we intend to hit the goal, um, but it's not an easy journey. And when we put this up, um, the fact is, at that point in time, Coles was still not agreeing to have a home brand policy around their uh, pork that was imported in their processed pork. So we took a giant leap of faith. I cannot stress that enough. And I would also suggest to you that this is going to be a test case for every other industry. Every other livestock industry is looking very carefully at how we manage this and whether we will be successful. And it is your, in your interest to make us successful. Ladies and gentlemen, that's uh, I think we ha all we have time for. I think in the afternoon session we've seen, in fact, a number of sort of conversations going on and perhaps those conversations continue uh, in afternoon tea. But before we go out, could we once again put our hands together for Graham, Melissa and Kathleen.